Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to my podcast today. This is my first virtual podcast today, and I am so excited. I have a guest for you today. I've had her on another program before, another platform. But she is on here today, Seanette Miller. She is a licensed psychotherapist and um, just want to bring her to the stage so she can share. Um, Like I said, the podcast is called Broken But Healed. So all of us have a story. We've all been broken, but we know that with the power of God, we can be healed. So I'm going to bring her to the stage without any further ado so she can just share a little bit about herself and her profession. So welcome, Seanette. How are you doing today? Thank you. I am doing well. It was so good to have you. I'm so excited. You look good. You're a woman of God. God has placed you in this profession for purpose for destiny. And I'm just so thankful to have you on this platform. So if you would just share a little bit about yourself. Amen. Okay. So my name is Seanette Miller and I'm a clinical social worker, which is a licensed therapist in the state of Georgia. I have a private practice where I see young people, couples, uh, individuals for therapy. And then I also do some work in the school system. So I have actually been in the school system. Can you believe it? For 23 (laughs) years. Oh my goodness. Uh, So it's been a long time. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. I'm just so excited to have you on here. Woman of God. I tell (laughs) you, she's got her own um, prayer uh, what would you say? Time on Saturday, Sunday, Sunday nights. Yeah. And I'm telling you, she's just praying heaven down. It's really blessed. And that's what we need in this world. Prayer, prayer. We need prayer. But I want you to just go ahead and share a little bit. My concern, like I told her before, is um, the young people, especially. That's our next generation. Now, things are happening, yes, to the adults, but we got to catch that 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 young group, that young generation, those that are committing suicide and, and feeling like they just don't, they don't even want to live. You know, we know what the root is, but I mean, are there any signs, uh, Shawnee, that you can tell people, parents to be looking for if their child may be, you know, going through something like that, suicide, just go ahead and just share with us today. Okay. So there's, there are a lot of signs um, and it really depends on your child. Of course, every child is an individual, but some typical signs that we will be looking at right? Primarily, is your child sad? Have you noticed that your child is crying a lot or not even crying? They just may be looking sad, Um, isolating, maybe staying in their room a lot. Um, What about their eating habits? Have, have, has that changed? Are they eating more than usual or eating less? Um, What about friendships, right? Are you finding that they're not spending as much time with their friends? Um, Also, a lot of people don't think about this, but is there increased use of alcohol or drugs, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Looking at those things, looking at uh, is there any other risky behavior? Because sometimes that risky behavior is just a cry for help. Yes. Um, Yes. And then also what many people may miss is actually that a young person or or an adult um, who is struggling with thoughts about suicide, especially, they will say something. It just may be subtle um, or it may be very direct. And so we have to listen to what our young people are saying and sometimes what they're saying with their pen, right? Oh. Or with their music or with okay. their art, oh. right? So looking at those uh, ways that they're talking to us and letting us know that they no longer want to be here. Oh, yeah, that is so sad. You know what? But a lot of young people now, they like to stay in their rooms. Oh, I mean, yes. overall, they just like to stay in their room and they're always on their phone. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I think a lot of times parents or even if you've got some, a child over your house and you need to pay attention mm-hmm. to what's going on, you know, observe. Right you know, what they're doing, because you never know what a child's doing when they're in their room or with the door right. shut. I look, I always say, open that door, right? Open that door. Right. Let me see what's going on in there. You know, right. So I tell right. you, you know, we just, we just really need to uh, be paying attention and focus on our children more. Um, just heard about a case and you and I were talking about this mm-hmm. child, I think 15, 14 years old committing suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, and, and I know right after COVID, we were actually seeing in the nation some of the highest rates of suicide. Um, and of course, we know that could have been connected to that lack of social interaction with their peers. Um, yes. and so we, we still see that, right? Even in Georgia, as recently as, as this past week, um, yes. a young person uh, taking their life on a college campus, right? And so it's still happening. Um, and so we have to be careful even sometimes how we interact with young people, True. right? And what I mean by that is sometimes as adults, we're very um, closed to some of their challenges. We kind of talk as if, you know, it's not really happening. We minimize, right, right. some of the struggles. And so we have to start listening more. Um, so let me ask you this. What about um, the atmosphere in a mm -hmm. child's home? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm makes, saying? Right. It's makes a big difference. So you were talking about that door staying closed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I always encourage parents, go into your child's room. Look at what they, they have on their walls, right? Oh, like, yeah. yeah. Listen to the music. Even if you don't say anything when you walk in, listening to the lyrics, right? Um, looking at whatever else you can see in the room, right? Are there any um, dark objects? Are there any signs that they could be um, maybe affiliated with a gang or affiliated with some type of occult practice, yes. right? But really just noticing and observing what do you physically see when you come in your child's room. Exactly. Yeah. So could you give me an example? You said um, noticing things on their walls, like pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you just kind of give a, just an example, like, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, right. So, so if you walk in a child's room and let's say they have uh, flowers, right? If it's a young lady, if there are flowers, things are bright, um, positive affirmations on their walls. That's not necessarily a room that I would be concerned about. Right. But if I go into a room and it's very dark, maybe everything is is covered in dark colors. Um, maybe there's um, lyrics to a song that talks about death. Yes. Um, you know, maybe all that you see in their closet is black, right? Right. Um, but just looking um, and seeing what do you actually see and are there any signs that this child is is um, maybe, you know, perhaps dabbling into the occult. Right, right. Um, exactly. Upside down crosses, right? Um, just okay. anything like that that you can see that would be a telltale sign as to what is your child really involved into that could be contributing to that atmosphere. Okay. Emotionally and physically, because it starts physically, right? By what we see, right. um, what we can touch. But a lot of times that's, right, translated into our emotions. Yes. So whatever we're giving ourselves attention to, and of course, a young person can, can become heavily involved um, in what they start to believe, right? right. So um, just paying attention. Yes. And that's why it's so good as parents, grandparents to... Um, speak life to your child mm -hmm. or to your grandchild speak life and not mm -hmm. death because you know a lot of times you know some parents oh get away from here oh ain't nobody thinking about mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. oh leave me alone you know just things right. like that because sometimes the parent may be dealing with something and they don't even have time to engage in what their own child is going through until at the last minute and then they want to know well, well how did that happen where'd that come from mm -hmm. you know so, you know, sometimes we as parents have to create a loving atmosphere for them, even mm -hmm. though the parent may be dealing with something. You still got to try to create an, a loving atmosphere for their child. Right. Yeah. A safe space is what I a call safe it. Space. Right? That's, and that's, a, that's a space where a young person can be affirmed, where a young person is free to make mistakes. And they're oh, not that's good too. scolded, but they are, you know, we're, we're pointing them in the right direction without breaking their spirit. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that safe space is is a place where a young person can come and and even say they've messed up or made a yes, mistake. That's good. Um, and so we want to create that for our young people. Exactly. So what do you think as far as different children react to divorce in different ways? Mm -hmm. Do oh, you yeah. think that could affect a child because they know that their parents are getting ready to get a divorce? Mm, definitely. 
right? And it happens all the time, even with older uh, young people. Sometimes we think it only impacts those younger kids, maybe five through 10, but it actually also heavily impacts teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you would find that uh, for a young person, parents, you know, a husband and a wife, that, that represents a certain level of stability, right? Emotional stability, financial um, stability. And so oftentimes when parents uh, divorce, sometimes young people tend to take that on, yes. right? Um, some, somehow, <laughs> you know, a lot of young people may feel like it's because of them. True. Right? That's what I've heard too. Yeah. And sometimes there's certain family dynamics, maybe if there has been a lot of argument or I was ask you about that too. Mm -hmm. And if there's a lot of uh, behavior, maybe that the young person is exhibiting and the parents are always talking about it or fussing about it. Right. Um, a lot of times, you know, our young people in interpret that as, you know, my parents are separating because of me or right. because of my behavior. Yes. Um, so it really depends. And then you just have some young people that are very, um, I don't want to say sensitive, but emotional. Um, and so anything like that, even a, a small argument can sometimes cause them to spiral into places yes. of sadness and depression. Um, and so what we do impacts, you know, yes. I've heard couples say, exactly. I've heard people say it's between me and him, but it's right. Not, exactly. Right. It is, but it's not because there's a lot of people that are associated with a couple, right? Exactly. About friendships and family members. So of course their child is heavily impacted. Yes, because I know of a particular situation where a child was in a home where the mother and father were actually fighting, mm -hmm. you know, Physically. fighting. Mm -hmm. And then the child, you know, had to eventually get on medication because, right. you know, mm -hmm. they just couldn't mm -hmm. handle that, you know. Yeah. And and as counselors, right, and, and especially those of us that work in the school system, we're mandated reporters. Um, and we actually can report certain households where there is. Oh, wow. Child fighting, right? Mm. Domestic violence is a, a key indicator. And of course, as a mandated reporter, we could make a report um, mm -hmm. on a family that's wrestling with that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, just want to let everyone know that this is uh, Seanette Miller. She's a mm -hmm. licensed psychotherapist, and we're just having a conversation with her today. And we hope and pray that whoever's listening will get some knowledge and get some mm -hmm. wisdom and also, a lot of times, I've said this before, Seanette, a lot of times we as Christians think that just is we could just pray something away. Right. Right. <laughs> right. You know, we could just go get go to the altar and get delivered. Right. I'm going to the altar again. I'm going to get delivered. Right. It's the same yeah. thing. I want to get delivered, you know. Right. But sometimes it takes more than that. Mm -hmm. Come on with that right there. Yeah, because we we have to, we live in this human body, right? And, mm -hmm. and we're imperfect, right? Um, and so it's not just our, our physical body experiencing sickness, sometimes the mind. The mind, yes. Experiences sickness. And so, of course, we pray. That's You start with prayer. Um, you start with fasting, right? You start with really asking God for that deliverance. But as you go, sometimes you have to take medicine. Right. Sometimes you have to engage in therapy longer than three sessions. Right. Because most on. people say I've talked to someone. I talked to someone again. OK. But sometimes, especially if you've experienced trauma, it can be a lifelong journey. Yes. Right. So inviting God into that process is is important. You know, if we have cancer in our bodies. Right. Most of us will go to see a doctor. Right. Yes. And we have treatment. Um, yes. But when the mind is sick, the mind, yes, I find that the uh, the body of Christ sometimes, I, and it could be due to shame, maybe um, sometimes it's because of fear of the unknown and what it's yes. like to to talk to a therapist, um, you know. But sometimes Somebody might say about us, right? That's true. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I always ask people, do you want help? Right. Or are you comfortable with staying in the position that you're in? 
Um, and, and it can be very sad because I've seen, you know, um, I've seen lots of Christians who are clinically depressed and yeah. they do need professional help, but they would refuse to get that help because they feel like maybe it makes them weak. Yeah. But some things we can't shout out. That's right? true. Um, <laughs> we can't. That's good. That is so true. Right. Some things you just can't shout you out. Can't Sometimes shout out. you just can't keep going to the altar and you keep going to the right. altar about the same thing. So, right, you know. right. Right. And and when you think about something as simple as anger, which is actually not simple, right? Because anger can manifest itself in so many destructive ways. Come right? on, talk about that right there a little bit more. Right. With the tone of our voice, right? With our body language, with the physical abuse that happens sometimes in households, right? If we don't have a good grasp on how we are not managing our anger, we won't get help. And so um, once you understand how much your behavior can impact others and, and tear down others, then it's important, right, that we get help. Yeah. We should be responsible enough as Christians to do everything that we can to reflect Christ. Yeah. And so if you're struggling with that, it's, it's not OK to just say, I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to get any help. And then we still treat those around us in a, you know, in a harmful way manner. And so it's important in the body of Christ for us to, to take um, the mental health supports available seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there's so much, you know, there's a lot of Christian counseling, right? So even if you didn't want to go to a, a non-Christian, go to someone who's a born again believer. Yes. Right. And until you are completely healed, if you feel that that's what God is doing in your life, until you are completely healed or delivered, you really need to get help. Yeah. Right? And I I always say it's it's to the point now where some Christians are irresponsible because they vomit their trauma onto mm. others. Right. There's there's experiences, life experiences that they've had that causes them to, to treat people in a way that's not very godly. And instead of getting help, we make excuses. Um, and so we have to be careful, even with something as simple as um, promiscuity, mm. right? If there's Come on with that. sexual abuse, if there's been any trauma sexually, right? Um, for those when they were young, oftentimes, right? They mm -hmm. grow up um, and along the journey, sometimes they've learned because of the abuse that this is the only thing that makes them valuable. And so, you know, and then also this is the only thing that makes them feel comforted and loved, right? Yeah. Because that's all they know. Wow. Um, and so we can be very judgmental as Christians, right? And so if a person comes into our midst, are we taking that time to really walk them through that process of deliverance? Are we yeah. reminding them who they are in Christ? Are we able to sit with them if we needed to support them, right? For yeah. longer than three sessions, right? Will right. we do that? Are, you know, are we establishing support groups in our congregations, right? Grief support, right? Yeah, well, that's good. Support, support with someone coming out of an abusive relationship, right? Support for those young people who are rescued from sex trafficking. Yes, right? yes. Because that's all of a sudden, they're not going to magically know how to be a, a young person, right? And a chaste young person, right? right? And so are we walking with them and being patient and giving them that mental health um, support so that they can overcome some of those challenges? Yes. That's good. Mm -hmm. So um, are you familiar with the term um, narcissist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. and I'm, la I'm laughing because oftentimes I'll have couples come into session and one is calling the other one, right? <laughs> narcissist, <laughs> right? Because of something um, that has taken place. But well, look, hold it right there before you answer that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sometimes a person could be dealing with something and not even acknowledge it themselves, but another mm -hmm. person can see it? Correct. I mean, yes. I, yes. I want you to kind of, I don't, I'm, I don't want to keep you all day, but <laughs> could you kind of explain that too? And then talk about the narcissist. You know, yes. I don't know if that's 
Right. So so you're saying so from the perspective that sometimes a person could be struggling with some a mental health issue and not realize that that, that yeah, that right there. Right, whether it's narcissism or or, or Any, depression yeah. or anything. And bipolar or I mean, you know, could they be dealing with these and, and not even somebody else sees it, but they don't they don't see it. They right. don't think, well, not me, it's somebody else. You know what I'm right. saying? Right, right. And a lot of times I think we're just in denial. Um, and so sometimes I think it's important to really be able to communicate to to people, hey, well, you know, last week you did this and tell help me to understand what you were thinking when you said that. Because sometimes that causes a person to pause and really open up and then say, okay, Seanette just told me there were three times that I responded harshly to criticism or whatever it is, right? Um, but I think being able to to really confront a person with some factual behaviors, factual experiences, um, so that there can be some dialogue, mm -hmm. right? And then also it's important sometimes, right? What's helpful to people is if you see an article that's talking about uh, depression or anxiety and being able to pass that on to your loved one or a friend sometimes is a gentle way of pointing out, hey, I really think you have this issue, right? And when we think about substance abuse, you know, 80% of the time, right? I'm just throwing out a number. Um, when you meet with someone, they don't want to be honest up front and they're going to minimize their drug use. They're going to minimize how often they're drinking the alcohol, right? They're going to minimize how often they're using prescription pills. Yes. Right. Um, and so it is important to confront the behavior sometimes. Um, and, and the dialogue, I think, is what really opens it up for you to see, okay, is it this or is it that? Um, and giving people an opportunity to explain themselves, um, for lack of a better word, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so, so I, in terms of narcissism, um, that will be an individual um, who I sometimes kind of term it <laughs> is above the law. <laughs> what I mean by that is they can do nothing wrong, right? They set the standard for certain behavior um, and they are very arrogant, right? In their um, relationship style with another person. And so, uh, Quite frankly, it's it's easier to to see in in couples in the romantic types of relationships, but of course, you also see it in in a person's parenting and and you know in a person's friendships. Oh wow, that's um, cool. Yeah, so there, you know, you it's hard to hide, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when a person is full of themselves, right? Yes. So um, that person that doesn't even want to listen to the other person's perspective. Right. Okay. Um, okay. It's often it's and it's challenging to yes. to really deal with someone and and I often say to people too you we're responsible for ourselves but you you can't be responsible for another person changing their behavior. Yes. And that's where it becomes difficult because if you have such a person in your life it's 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 difficult to get them to really buy into your perspective. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So two other things I want to ask you before we leave. Um, um, well, I don't know. What do you think causes a person or child to cut themselves? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that several so, reasons? I'm just right. talking about here. There are several reasons. Um, of course, a, a child who's experiencing clinical depression could be someone who cuts. Um, and and then you also have a lot of young people who um, learn the behavior um, and they learn the behavior as a way of coping with very difficult um, memories and coping with trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you also have young people who, quite frankly, don't like themselves. Um, and so cutting gives them some means of physical satisfaction to express the fact that I don't like myself, I'm not good enough. Um, 
even young people that struggle with the, with levels of confidence and low self-esteem sometimes could also be cutters. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for the most part, you're going to find that a, a child that is depressed and sad um, will tend to cut. But not every young person who's depressed will cut. Right, right. right? So there could be um, other reasons, other um, issues in the family, right? There could be... Um, it could be a child that isolates and is just experimenting with, with trying to come to terms with that emotional pain that they may be carrying. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, trauma. Could you just touch on that just a little bit? Trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, the name of this podcast is Broken but Heal, mm -hmm. and we know that God has brought all of us from a long way. Mm -hmm. All of us, in some way, have been broken. But God is a healer. Yes. He, he can heal anybody. Yes. So I just want you to kind of, in your own words, tell me about trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is, I mean, that's a big word. That's, that could right. go a lot of ways. Right. It is. And there are a lot of treatment. Emotional modalities. trauma, I think, you know, is what I'm right. saying. Right. To address it. And, and it's important to also realize there are a lot of people in therapy, right, who have had the emotional trauma, but they've also had some physical trauma. Right. Okay. As well. um, and so a, a traumatic experience would be any experience that leaves a negative effect on a person that causes us to have memories about those experiences. Um, it usually trauma happens and leaves a scar. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, usually people are violated when they experience trauma. Um, but then when we think about um, our people, right, and our ancestors, right? Yeah. We collectively, right, have experienced trauma and still do because of policies and procedures that are in place that perpetuate that cycle mm -hmm. um, of discrimination. And so um, you often hear about veterans, um, that experience PTSD, right? Yes. Based on a traumatic experience. Um, people who may have been involved in abusive situations emotionally, mm -hmm. physically. Um, I mentioned young people who have been sex trafficked, right? Mm -hmm. Or who have even been brought here from other countries. Yeah. Um, and the trauma of being raped, the yeah. trauma of, of being forced right, into a life of prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you think about um, children, right, who are, yeah. are continuously raped, who ha have engaged in acts to be used for pornography, right? Um, there's so much. Yes. Right. And then for yes. some young people, they would probably even tell you that they experienced trauma as it relates to their parents' divorce, right? Because the levels of anger and the levels of rage yes. and the behaviors, right, that one or both of the parents exhibited. Um, so there's so much. And then you, you also have parenting, right? Trauma. <laughs> right. But we sometimes as parents are not behaving in the best way to our, to our young people, right? And it can be very traumatic yeah. when a parent decides to curse and scream in public. If a six-year-old maybe touched candy in the Walmart line and then the parent uses all types of language, right? Yeah. Um, embarrassing the child, degrading, all right, the child. Um, and then, of course, you have trauma in the forms of incest, right, in within a household, right, um, where a child is sexually violated, right, by a parent or a parent's friend. And so there's so much. And then yes, and I, and I also want to mention this part because we've talked a lot about young people. You also have... Um, young people who are engaged in, in gang activity. Yes, that's There's good. A lot of trauma that happens just yes. initiated. That's um, good. Yeah, that's and good. and then continues, right? Yes. yes. Uh, so there so there can be a lot. Yes. Yeah. Well this has been so good. And um tell the people how they can get in touch with you. Um do you have a website, a phone number? or I do. So I do. So my private practice is Connect for Counseling. And so my website is www.connect.
connect4counseling.com. Um, and then my number, I can be reached at 678-481-4208. Um, I also have a Facebook page that's Connect for Counseling as well. And then I also have a prayer ministry, um, yes. which is Heart to Heart Women's Prayer. So I am um, a therapist that believes in the power of prayer. There are I some strong ones, right? I that love can, it. Can That's the foundation right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the prayer. Oh, yeah. So some strongholds can only be broken with prayer. And so I often, when I see anyone in my practice, I'm also prayerful. Um, yes. Because I know yes. that God's wisdom can often get to the root of a problem. Even though we're walking through it on a professional level, God still has to be in the midst. Yes, yes, yes. Cycle. Yes. So yes. it is possible to be broken but here, yes. right? Yes. yes absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So I just thank you so much, so much for coming on today. This is my first virtual podcast and I didn't even want it to go forth unless I had you on first. Okay. I wanted you to be the forerunner. Yes. <laughs> I wanted you to be the forerunner. Uh, so um, I'm getting ready to close, but would you close us out in prayer? And if I, I'm going to stop the recording, but I want you to stay uh, backstage so we can chat a little bit before. So if you'll okay. close us out in prayer, and thank you so, so, so much for coming on. You are very welcome. I want to make this comment real That's quick. That's right. I wanted to ask I'm you that. Judy, I'm, last looking, time. I'm looking at the, um, on my wall, you can see the, the sign that says choose hope. So I want to yes. encourage us, um, even as we experience life circumstances that cause us to be broken, know that our hope can be found in Christ. Yes. Um, and so when we choose to trust him, right, we're choosing hope. We're choosing to believe that there can be a better day and that we will continue this healing journey until we are completely healed. Yes. Um, so it's possible. Yes, it is. The help is out there if you, yes, it is. if you want it. I love it. Choose hope. I'm going to have to yes. tweet that. Choose hope. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna you you ask me to pray. I can't. Yes, remember. and then okay. we're gonna close out after your prayer. Okay, so Father, I thank you right now for yes. just your presence. God, thank you for being in the midst. Thank you for each and every person that will yes. listen to this podcast, Lord. I pray that even as they listen, that you would speak to their hearts, God, that you would ignite a passion on the inside of them to hear from you. Father, we pray that through your deliverance and through your healing, God, we pray that we would see a brighter day. We thank you in advance for what you're doing in hearts, and we thank you for destroying yokes that keep us in bondage. We give you praise, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you once again, Shana, for being on here. And, and next time for the next podcast, Broken But Here. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.